Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Hopefully you're having a great weekend. A quick shout out to my newest patrons, M. Ba, Mark, Gordon, Gary, David, and Gibson. Greatly appreciate the support and I should have a Patreon video uploaded later today. And before we get into today's episode, the title of this video is kind of posed as a question. We're going to get there momentarily, but just stay tuned. I genuinely want to hear where you guys stand on this. First up, some more frustrating political news. The clean energy program is likely to be dropped because of Manchin's objections. So no, this decision isn't final, they are still negotiating, but the clean energy performance program, we'll refer to this as the CEPP, the linchpin of Biden's proposed climate change legislation, is likely to be dropped from the Democrats' spending bill because of opposition from one senator, Joe Manchin from West Virginia. So this is a $150 billion program on the brink of being nixed completely because of, yes, really one person. Essentially, the CEPP would pay electric utility companies that switch from fossil fuel to renewable or clean energy sources and then fine those that don't. Gutting the clean energy component of the spending bill would mark a devastating blow for Biden's climate agenda just two weeks before he heads to a closely watched UN Global Climate Summit in Glasgow, Scotland, which would likely undermine Biden's negotiating hand at the meeting. As mentioned, the CEPP's collapse is likely, but not certain. Now, Manchin has been publicly critical of such a plan, arguing that it's unnecessary because utility companies are already making that switch on their own. I think this would be optimistic at best. At least when referring to most energy companies. Yes, some are transitioning, but definitely not all. And this is disheartening because this would basically stall this program, which is looking to generate 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in the next nine years, could create up to 77,000 jobs. The US right now only generates two megawatts of offshore wind energy. And the Block Island Wind Turbine, which is an offshore wind farm, one of the first in the US, I believe it began operation back around 2016, but this facility alone was estimated to produce 125,000 megawatt hours every year, which is enough to power 17,000 homes. And if you're wondering why Manchin is opposing this, well, it simply comes down to politics. Yes, he is getting money from oil, and he has to appease both the Democrats and also the conservatives in West Virginia, as you'll see from this data, as coal mining in particular dominates West Virginia's economy. And as you can see, Manchin is getting a significant amount of money from natural gas companies like Valero Energy, National Fuel Gas, and DT Energy, which have long supported Manchin's political career. And look, yes, right now this is disappointing, but it's really easy for us keyboard warriors to sit back and criticize somebody, but being in that position, you do have two sides. You have the oil and gas, and then you have this new renewable energy. They are opposed, jobs are going to be won and lost. So that being said, if you can't see the desperate need to move to renewable energy and to do it as fast as possible, I really think you have your head in the sand. And sadly, I can promise you, Manchin is not the only one with his head in the sand. But moving on, I wanna give you guys some key notes, facts, and statistics about TSMC and the chip industry right now. So Tesla was set to work with TSMC on hardware four until they switched to Samsung. Samsung was rumored to be using the seven nanometer technology where TSMC is going to be the first fab in the United States capable of producing five nanometer tech producing wafers by 2024. TSMC is building a $12 billion, 1100 acre fab in the Arizona desert just outside of Phoenix. Samsung is the only other fab in the world right now capable of making five nanometer chips. And having TSMC on US soil is going to be crucial for the entire technology industry over the next decade. You'll see why momentarily. So TSMC makes up 24% of the world's chip supply and get this 90% of the most advanced chips. They're spending $100 billion to scale production due to the chip shortage. TSMC has 12 fabs globally. Most of them, however, are in Taiwan and China. Today, only 12% of semiconductors are made in the US, down from 37% back in the 1990s. This, of course, poses multiple risks. TSMC branching out from Taiwan is crucial. Currently, there are real geopolitical and natural disaster, think earthquake risks, with the island of Taiwan, and much of the world is relying on that chip fabrication that happens on that small island. Now, I personally have my doubts about the chip shortage ending next year, like some people are saying, but either way, part of my doubt is because there is one company, ASML, that makes this $180 million UV light machine that's required for the most advanced chips today. 
So ultimately, the companies relying on the most advanced technology have one company that they are all going to for the same machine. That is not a great situation. Some fun facts, lithography, which are just small rays of light, are used to etch designs into these chips. The smaller the width of the transistor gate, whether it's five nanometers, seven nanometers, the more processing power can fit in a given space. The smallest transistors, by the way, are more than 10,000 times thinner than human hair, which when you try to even think about that, it doesn't even make sense. It's just crazy. And most cars today use 28 to 40 nanometer chips. And there has been a lot of speculation about the fabs not being as interested in continually producing this technology as it is considered older and becoming outdated. And TSMC needs 4.7 million gallons of water per day to support production. Taiwan has been struggling with a water drought since around 2019. The good news here for this Arizona fab is that TSMC's new plant will recycle 90% of water used at the fab. So I'm sharing this because anybody that likes technology, phones, computers, laptops, cars, anything and everything uses semiconductors, we need to stay up and aware of what's going on in this industry. Okay, so getting to the title of the video, is Tesla's demand becoming a problem? What am I talking about? Well, if we go to the Tesla order page, the Model 3, first thing you see, delivery may. Okay, we've known delivery times have been long, but if you go down and choose the aero wheels for the standard range Model 3, we are now getting into an estimated delivery date of August, 2022. We're quickly approaching a one year delay for Tesla's most affordable vehicle. Now, yes, overall, this is still a very good thing, but I can promise you Tesla is absolutely going to lose sales because people have to wait so long for their vehicle. And I've said before on the channel, I had a friend not buy a Tesla because he couldn't wait even one month for a car. And look, I'm not trying to say that this small faction of people that won't buy a Tesla because of the wait times, that that's somehow going to harm Tesla's overall business model and financials. I'm not saying that but at the same time having to wait 10 months for your new vehicle is painful and tesla will lose some sales because of these wait times and right now they've only been climbing so look yes overall this demand is wonderful for tesla they are crushing it it's a beautiful time to be a fan of tesla I'm just saying, let's not forget, Tesla needs to do everything it can to keep up with production to try to keep these wait times as low as possible or else they will miss out on sales. Another quick note, there's some news circulating that Tesla is no longer offering wood trim on the Model S Plaid, but on my configurator right now at least, we still have the walnut decor. As you can see, it does not say carbon fiber. Some other people are seeing carbon fiber only, so we'll see what happens with that. Next up, Tesla is also hiring a mechanical design engineer for the semi-truck battery. So yes, they have some prototypes built out in the wild doing testing, but they are clearly still refining, changing, and working on the final iteration of the semi-truck. Next up, won't spend much time here, but in case you missed it, Elon did actually do a video call with some of the top management at Volkswagen. Herbert Diess had Elon on to basically give them a kick in the butt to encourage Volkswagen's top leadership to move to this EV transition as fast and hopefully as efficient as possible. So I love to see this relationship between Diess and Elon working together, being pretty friendly. I really wish there was more of that in the transition to electrification. Also over the weekend, Tesla finally started deliveries of the Model X Plaid. Here you see a quick walkthrough video from Pierce Zhuang on YouTube. Now, nothing really revolutionary here, but the video is linked below if you want to check it out and some anecdotal evidence. So people were asking, is it the Plaid or just the long range? Seemingly it's all long range Model X's thus far. Plaid is apparently waiting regulatory approvals and these are all rumored to be six seaters. So the five and seven seat variants are not yet available. People that had one of those configurations were being emailed saying if they move to six seats, they can get their delivery sooner. So it looks like for now, Tesla is only focused on the six seat long range Model X for delivery, perhaps through the rest of this year. And just earlier today, Tesla on Twitter shared some new pictures of the first Model X refreshed long range six seat vehicles. And they also shared a five minute explainer video of the Model X linked below if you wanna check it out. Moving to Twitter, Elon asked, do you ever think SpaceX could have an open house at its facilities in Cali, Brownsville, and Florida? It would be a great way to get the community excited about what you guys do. Great idea, but Elon said, we can only do it partially. Detailed rocket technology is considered advanced weaponry, same tech as nuclear missiles. So there are more limitations than at Tesla. And anything Tesla on Twitter asked Elon, when can we expect the single stack? Will it be V11? 
Elon said, yeah. So not a ton of detail, no information on when V11 will come. This was talked about last holiday season. Maybe we all got it wrong thinking it was gonna be 2020 and it'll ultimately be 2021, but we'll have to see how many iterations in the 10 dot series Tesla decides to do before moving to V11. Matt Wallace said, Elon Musk is now richer than Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined. And Elon replied, hopefully enough to extend life to Mars. So more between Elon and Warren and check out this return right here by Warren Buffett. Pretty nice, you know, spin shot there. Although he did have it then slammed in his face. Anyway, Elon now worth about $236 billion. To this video, Elon said, maybe Buffett should invest in Tesla. Haha. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. Nice, playful jab between Elon and Warren. And Tesla Silicon Valley shared a video of a solar roof. And you know, we have to at least take a peek. I can't not watch these videos. It just looks so good, so new, so modern. I really hope they can bring this more into the mainstream over the next five years. But there you have it, obviously a beautiful home and you guessed it, it's new home construction, which is where Tesla is going to have their major push for the solar roof. Yes, retrofits will still be a thing, but it's hard, it's laborious, it's expensive. So new homes is really where they need to spend their time. And I thought this new animation was pretty cool. Ava shared it on Twitter. When you're heating your car, you see this little red heat on the windshield. I like it. And to send you guys off today, I wanna to share some pretty impressive clips from AI Driver who does a great job. Definitely subscribe to his channel if you're interested in the FSD beta. So enjoy those clips. Please like the video if you did. Hope you all have a wonderful day and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. But I think the behavior here is pretty incredible. If you look back just a couple of my videos that I released, uh, you'll see the beta really struggling through intersections like this and waiting for a giant gap to open up before it's even comfortable inching forward. And here we are seeing something much different. Autopilot is slowly creeping forward here, almost the entire time looking for a gap in traffic big enough to make this right hand turn. Uh, this is very human-like, as you can see by the other cars around us doing the same thing, and is another pretty good example of path prediction for the other vehicles. Seemed like it wanted to go there for a second, but changed its mind, uh, pulling out in front of the van who was making a right-hand turn and getting us through here very nicely indeed. Now, don't get me wrong, there were definitely a few times there was probably a big enough gap for us to fit into that I would have gone for if I was the one driving, but combining safety with aggression must be an extremely hard thing for the beta to learn how to do with other humans on the road.